Hi. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, and a very special welcome to our great writer, the one and only Tracy Chevalier. Uh, some housekeeping notes just first. Phones off and on silent, please, if you will. Uh, no fire drill is planned, so if the alarm <laughs> goes off, it's for real, but don't panic. Just make your way orderly in orderly fashion to the exits. Uh, Tracy will be signing copies of her new book, A Single Thread, in the signing tent. So when we end the session today, if you'd let her get to her seat and get her pen at the ready before you start to leave, that would be very kind. And can we just add that um, the book doesn't officially come out for two more weeks. So this is the first. You get it before anybody else. Yes. Ooh, nice. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sure that for most of you, uh, Trace Duvalier needs no introduction. But for the few of you who've been tempted by the lure of that wonderful name. Who have been dragged along. <laughs> or been dragged <laughs> along, regal by friends and family. <laughs> uh, just a few notes. Uh, the author of nine books, uh, Tracy is an American who has adopted Britain. She studied creative writing at the University of East Anglia in the celebrated course run by Malcolm Bradbury and Rose Tremaine. She's described as a historical novelist, but in truth, her novel stretched that term to its limits because what she captures is much more than just the past. She explores creativity, community, and displacement across generations, cultures, and geographies. She is, above all, a sensory writer who evokes the atmosphere surrounding her characters, their sense of challenge, place, and identity. With, as Tracy said, her new book, A Single Thread, due out shortly, and with the girl with a pearl earring, the opera, opening in Zurich next May, and with an American tour coming up, these are exciting times, I hope. The, the new book, A Single Thread, is, as, as she said, appearing in the bookshops on the 5th of September, but by special arrangement, it is here for you to buy in, the, uh, in advance uh, at the Edinburgh Book Festival. It traces the experience of Violet Speedwell in 1930s Britain. Unmarried and set adrift from family and community, she reconnects herself and finds a new community by an unusual route through becoming involved in the embroidering of kneelers in Winchester Cathedral. So, Tracy? Yes. Why the 1930s? <laughs> why Violet? Why kneelers? And why embroidery? Oh, wow. Okay, a lot of whys there. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll start with the why kneelers, because that leads to everything else. Um, I, in a way, why, why cathedrals? That's how I would, um, I would, that's how it all started. I've loved cathedrals all my life. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and there's a, a ca the Washington Cathedral, the National Cathedral there, has, was being built while I was growing up, or the finishing touches are put on it. It took like 100 years to build it which in this day and age, you'd think it wouldn't take that long because um, some of the Gothic cathedrals only took that long and they didn't have engines and you know diggers mm -hmm. and things. So um, I always wondered about that. And, but I used, to s I used to steal into the cathedral uh, when I was a teenager and try all the locked doors to see if I could get, I could get out into the back air bits. And I just loved them. And, and when I moved to Europe, I, um, because this is Europe, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's just say it. Okay, slight tangent, it's the only politics I'm going to say. When I moved here, um, I had been taught that the United Kingdom was part of Europe, and then I moved to London, and people kept talking about England and Europe, and I was a little taken aback by that. That was in 1984, so <laughs> now I understand a little better. But anyway, that's it. We're not going to talk no more, no more. Um, <laughs> When I started traveling around a lot in Europe, I started visiting uh, cathedrals. The first cathedral I visited in the United Kingdom was in Salisbury. Um, totally fell in love with it. And then I fell in love with Ely and Wells and Chartres and um, Lincoln and Canterbury, all sorts, all over. Liverpool, fantastic. Um, and I, uh, a few years ago, I thought, I, s I love cathedrals so much, I want to write, I want to set a novel in and around a cathedral. Which cathedral shall it be? Now, I had been to Winchester before, and I thought, there's some really good stories attached to Winchester Cathedral. Not much to look at on the outside, but there's a lot of history in it. Jane Austen's buried there. 
English Civil War uh, soldiers rampaged through it. Um, its foundations were sinking in the 20th century, and a diver had to single-handedly go down shore it up over five years. So it's lots of stories to tell. So I went down one day to look around, um, thinking I would tell one of those more obvious stories. And then I went into this the library there, and they had a display of all kinds of different things that were made in the cathedral. And they had a display of embroidery of alms bags and cushions and kneelers that had been embroidered for the choir stalls by a group of volunteer women from 1931 mm. to 36. So that answers your first question, why the 1930s? Because those cushions and kneelers were made during that time. Um, and why, d but why was I struck by them? I don't know, but there was something about them that really appealed to me that um, I just had this imagining of this group of volunteer women sitting around gossiping and uh, there'd always be one who was thought she knew more than everyone else. Okay, how many people have been in volunteer groups before? You know the petty politics that go on? Well, that's what I was gonna write about, uh, like a gentle satire on the petty politics of volunteer groups. And then- And I so love the fact that when Violet goes to, to try and join the group, she his of course, she has to start at the bottom by tidying yes. out the materials cupboard. Yes, she doesn't, she's not allowed to um, uh, embroider right away. She has to tidy, there are all kinds of different jobs. And it was a huge job. I mean, it's the, there were 56 long um, cush cushions with very elaborate embroidered circles in the middle, these medallions that were of uh, scenes of history, uh, especially Winchester history. And then there were over 300 kneelers is there anybody in the audience who has made a kneeler for their church? Yes, I'm seeing a couple of hands. Yes, it's um, uh, that movement. There's quite a big movement to do this now, um, still is. And a lot of it initi was initiated by Louisa Pessel, who was the organizer and designer of these cushions and kneelers at Winchester. So I was just drawn in by all of this. And I thought, well, what if I take a woman who's living during that time and have her arrive at Winchester and drop her into that volunteer group? What, what, and then I thought, well, what's her background gonna be? And so her name is Violet Speedwell. And I thought, what's her background gonna be? And I started looking into the lives of women in the 1930s. And what really fascinated me was um, the idea of the quote unquote surplus women which is what the newspapers dubbed women who um, didn't marry after World War I. They lost their fianc fiancés. There was a, a surplus of two million more women than men at the time. And um, it was a very condescending term. And I thought, what would it be like to have lost your fiancé, realized there weren't men you were going to be able to you weren't going to find somebody to marry. And this was a society that was set up to marry. Um, women were not really encouraged to go into higher education or have careers. I mean, some of them were teachers and there were nurses, not a whole lot more than that. And um, they were looked down on. They were named called spinsters, old maids, all the, the pejorative terms. And I thought, how would a woman, how could she fight her way through that? And how could she use embroidery to find um, a, some sort of meaning in life? And that's how... So is that all your wise? So that was embroidery, <laughs> Violet, 1930s. But you can answer me this. Violet doesn't come as an embroider. She has to learn it. In yes, the, she does. And that's very interesting, that you don't set her up as somebody who walks into the end and, yeah. and, and they go, oh, fantastic, come and join us because your stitcher is so wonderful. No. She actually finds it very, very hard to do. Yeah. And she has to unpick it quite a lot of times. Yes, yes, they're very um, exacting. And if you go to Winchester Cathedral, you can see these cushions and kneelers. You can sit on them, you can kneel on them if you want, and, um, and you can inspect the embroidery. And in fact, that might be a good point. I w thought I'd just like you to hear a little bit of it. So there's mm. a, a bit of embroidery inspection in this scene. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna stand because it's easier that way, more dramatic. Um, so Violet gets a job as, all you need to know is she moves to Winchester from Southampton. It's only 12 miles away, but she leaves her mother who's really angry about it. And she's a typist at an insurance company. So she's taught how to embroider. One evening after work, Violet sat in the cathedral presbytery inspecting a kneeler to see how the broderer had blended the blues and considering how to do the same with the yellows and the borders she was working on. 
As she pulled at the stitches, someone took a seat next to her. She was startled to find it was Louisa Pessel and let out a little yelp, then apologized. Miss Pessel smiled. I like to come here sometimes just to sit and look. Violet nodded. It felt like having a member of the royal family sit by her, though one wearing a brown turban trimmed with a tuft of feathers. Sometimes I wonder if we couldn't use even more color here. It's so dark, especially in the choir stalls. Miss Pessel nodded at the wood stalls to their left. The stone and wood just, to, just soak it up, even the mustard yellow some are complaining about. People are complaining? Oh, oh yes. Miss Pessel's laugh was like a low bell ringing in the presbytery. They say it's vulgar and inappropriate in a religious setting. Have you always embroidered? Since I was a girl, yes. Then I taught it, here and abroad, and that rather set me on the path for life. Abroad? I taught embroidery in a girls' school in Greece for several years. I became something of an expert in Greek embroidery. Gosh. Miss Pessel seemed so English that it was hard to imagine her in a foreign climate, gently perspiring in blazing sun, teaching a class of Greek girls the rice stitch or long-armed cross in a stark white building against a background of bright blue sea and sky. Violet wanted to ask about a husband, but didn't, for that was the question she most hated being asked herself. I traveled a bit too, Louisa Pessel continued, smiling at the memories. To Egypt, to India, glorious. I even rode a camel once, then back the then during the war, I was back in Bradford. Bradford? Indeed, I grew up in Bradford. During the war, I taught embroidery to convalescent soldiers. Do you know, Miss Speedwell, sewing can be so therapeutic when one has had trauma. The bold colors and the repetition of simple stitches had such a soothing effect on the men. There was something about creating a thing of beauty that works wonders on their nerves. I was very pleased with the results. So, is that yours? She nodded at the kneeler in Violet's lap. I know the broderers like to come and visit their work in situ, as it were. No, I was looking at others' work to see how they handled colors. Which pattern are you working on over the summer? Oh, I'm not making a kneeler. Mrs. Biggins has assigned me to make borders for the cushions. Lengths and lengths of borders. Have you made your sampler? Yes. And taught the stitches to someone else? Yes. And would you like to make a kneeler? I would. I'm curious, Miss Speedwell. Why? There will be over 300 kneelers, so yours would get lost in the crowd. Whereas there will be far fewer cushions, and they'll be very striking. And the borders, of course, will be essential. I know, it's just... You want to make something wholly yours that will be properly seen and used. Yes. All right, then. Miss Pessel stood and gestured at the kneelers on the chairs around them. Choose the design you would like to make. She already knew and pointed to a kneeler with checkered acorn caps. Miss Pessel nodded. That is a good one. I am pleased with all of the designs by and large, but like a mother with her children, I secretly have my favorites, too. Thank you. Thank I should you, say, Julie. by the way, this is the very first event I've done for this book, so you're getting me fresh and un <laughs> unrehearsed. <laughs> it's very interesting there how you talk about um, the history of sewing being used yeah, in, as in their combat lessons, yeah. you know, in, in, in after the First World War, then all sorts of soldiers were involved in embroidery. Uh, and um, and basically, you people in the Royal School of Needlework and other volunteers would go into um, convalescent hospitals or into people's yeah. homes. What is it about that kind of stitching that you think is efficacious to people who are, well, particularly after the First World War, many were shell shocked. Yeah. So they had lost control over both their mental but also their physical uh, um, movements. Well, I think um, I think there are a number of things. Um, and I base this on personal experience from having uh, quilted and then did a little embroidery while I was researching the book. And also, um, I've done work with the, the UK charity Fine Cell Work, mm -hmm. which 
Claire has written a fantastic book called Threads of Life, which is about the, the history of sewing and stitching. And um, you talk about uh, Fine Cell Work a I little do. bit in it. Uh, Fine Cell Work is a, a charity that goes into prisons and teaches prisoners to sew um, to both needlepoint and, um, and also quilting, and then they sell what they've made, um, and they earn a little bit of money, but more importantly, it's incredibly therapeutic, because a lot of these guys, and mostly it's men, have never um, made, have never been praised, and never sat quietly and made something beautiful, colorful, useful, but something other people love. And I think that it's all of those things for uh, soldiers after the war and during the war, uh, to, to make something that takes you outside of yourself. So you're not thinking about your problems, you're focusing on um, the matter at hand. It, take, it keeps you in the moment. We have such a hard time being in the moment now. We're, we're thinking about what has gone on in our lives, we're thinking about the future, what's going to go on, and to actually let all of that drain away and simply focus on this little bit of color that's in your hand that you're making grow, and you can see it growing is is incredibly important and one of the prisoners i met said he felt that um the the important he could never sew when he was angry and sewing calmed him down mm -hmm. and that made all the difference and that was what he found he said far more important than any kind of um money that he made or or even sitting the the sociability of sewing which is also important what was important to him is that it, it made him calm. And I think that all of those things happen. I mean, we were talking before, we both sew uh, quilting, or, and you've done lots of other sewing, banners and dolls clothes earlier, um, you told me. And I think that those things, um, do you know what that feeling I mean when you are sewing and nothing else matters? Nothing else matters, and you're, as you say, in that wound. But I think it's also that thing where Violet wants to make her kneeler because she wants a sense of her own self-esteem by actually yeah. completing something that others will view and having kind of met the challenges of the, 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 the stitching involved. Yes. And I think for, for, for uh, all sorts of people, in that sense of accomplishment, of actually t you know, taking on a task, even though it's at very difficult times, and seeing it through, and then it going out into the world, as you say, for yeah. others to use or to witness, et cetera, is, is part of a process they say about sewing, that it's, it's not an object, it's actually a conversation. You know, it's not actually With completed. your fingers until, and the... Well, and, and, and until people actually see it or use, use it, it, it's not actually, it's, its journey isn't complete. And I like that idea that, you know, th that it's a way of connecting to other people. Can I go back mm -hmm. to the past, possibly, to, uh -oh, your, okay. to your childhood? I was interested in the fact your father was a photographer with the Washington Post, yep. and I'm imagining a house that's just full of images, hmm. and your books are very visual. Do you think that that childhood, was that childhood filled with visual stories for you? Do you think that impacted on the way you write? Possibly. Um, by the way, my father would have been 100 yesterday. Oh. And, um, mm. and he was a great guy. Um, he worked for the Washington Post as a photographer for 35 years. Mm. And um, when he was, um, he would come home at night and tell us stories about, you know, he, he met all the presidents or he took pictures of all of them. He worked, um, he covered Watergate, he covered the riots after Martin Luther King's assassination. He covered the Beatles when they came to Washington. He had great stories to tell, but he was very, um, he never wrote them down. Uh, he was a great raconteur, but he also liked to tell his stories through pictures. And um, we had probably more photographs than we had books in the house. It's not that we didn't read, we did read, but we got our books from the library, so we'd take them back every week. So there was like a, I think this is like a lot of us, there was a shelf full of books that we got as presents and things like that. and then the real books, the real cycle of books came through the library. Um, and um, it's interesting, I have a brother and a sister, and my sister um, is a graphic designer, so she went down the, the visual route. And my brother um, builds houses, he makes things with his hands, and I'm the verbal one. I talk a lot, <laughs> and, huh, and, um, and I write a lot. But having said that, I grew up in an era which was a very visual era with television and film. 
and um, the way I write is really visual. And um, as you said, I focus on the senses. So if I'm if I'm stuck in a scene, I'll think, okay, what does it smell like? What do they touch? What is it? What is she hearing? Um, and often when I'm writing a scene, I'll I'll think of it in my head. I'll turn it as if it's a film, and then I write down what I see. And I I think that's quite common from our era of of growing up with um, with television and film so much in our lives. But it may well have had to do with my dad as well. Having said yeah, that, I, I take terrible photos myself, so <laughs> good thing I stuck with the writing. But, but, but when you're doing your research, um, because you're doing historical novels, then obviously it must be comparatively easy, uh, particularly now with Google, to access the facts that are involved. But actually, as you say, what you create are the sensory worlds of the yeah. past. And that's much more elusive. That's much harder to, to create that tangibility that, yeah. you, that you actually do achieve in your books when you actually feel that you're sitting with that person in that space. What kind of research do you do in order to capture that? So much. Um, so first of all, I don't like Google too much. I use it a bit, but I really like reading books, sitting and reading books and taking notes. Um, because published books, well, we hope they have been through a rigorous checking, fact checking. And Google, um, people see one fact that somebody's gotten wrong and they repeat it. And so you think that you've got it from two different sources and actually they're both just repeating each other. So you have to be very careful. I like to be accurate, but I, I, um, I read a lot and I, I look a lot and I spend a lot of time. So for a single thread, um, I read a lot about the 1930s, about women at that period. I read a lot about embroidery and I did the embroidery. So in the book, Violet at one point makes a spectacles case for her mother and a needle case for her, for her niece. Um, and I described them and then I made them. Uh, I, I drafted the scenes and then I, then I sat down and, and learned mm -hmm. the stitches and made them. And it makes a big difference because you feel how the wool pulls through those holes and you can, you can say, oh, this is how you, um, here's the problem you might have with the needle, or here's what it feels like, or when, it, when you do it wrong and you have to unpick it, that feeling that you have, all of that stuff is much, actually much easier to describe if you've done it yourself. So I often, in my research process, will do the things that my character does. So when I wrote Girl with the Pearl Earring, I, um, I took a painting class, which I was terrible at, but at least I learned how painters held paint and mixed it and what they did. And, um, when I wrote uh, a novel called Remarkable Creatures, which is about a uh, fossil hunter named Mary Anning in Lyme Regis, I spent hours fossil hunting as well. With single thread, I, uh, I learned to embroider. The Last Runaway, a few books back, was about a quilter, and I learned to quilt. So doing those things makes it much easier to write about than, simp than trying to recreate it without knowing. Um, right, so there's so a lot for, of that. So, for example, in um, a single thread, in one of the most evocative places is the pub. Did you actually then spend a lot of time <laughs> in local pubs you to get that? You got me. Yes. Okay. Just for that, I'm going to read that scene. Um, so, yes, um, there is a certain feeling in a pub, in an English pub. Irish bar, I mean, Irish bars and Scottish uh, pubs are very different from each other and from English pubs, you know, they do feel different. And um, and then to try to get one in the 1930s, how did that feel? I had to read about, about it. And I had to read a lot about, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what a woman would have ordered mm. in the pub. So I'm gonna read you a quick scene, taking the mint out of my mouth. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I had a very dry mouth. Um, now I don't so much. So, okay, I'm gonna read you the pub scene, a very short bit, just to give you a sense of how I set a scene up. Um, Violet is going on a, her own summer holiday, walking holiday. She's just walked 15 miles. She's in a little village called Nether Wallop. It's a great name. And um, I did the walk too, and I, this pub I didn't sit in because it's shut now, but I've sat, sat in many other pubs. And she's about to meet a man. Pubs were generally not places women spent much time in. 
Never in the public bar side, of course, which was reserved for men and was dingier, darker, and focused on the serious business of drinking. Women could sit in the saloon side, usually with others, but there was always a sense of them being mere, merely tolerated in what was a male preserve. A pub was not a soft place. The wood bar and beams and tables and chairs, the worn carpet, the sharp gleam of the taps and glasses, all gave off an unyielding hardness that was not encouraging to women. Country pubs were easier, with more give to them, but you still saw few women and none on their own. The Five Bells, though, was different. Perhaps because she was staying in a room upstairs and so was expected to eat there, Violet felt her purpose in being in the pub was not questioned. When she went, walked in, the publican waved her over to a table in the corner and came over to take a drinks order. A dry sherry and the steak and kidney pie, she said. The barman showed no surprise at this unusual combination, though when he brought her drink, she realized it did not go well with the pie and asked for some water as well. As she sipped her sherry and waited for her meal, Violet looked around. There was a scattering of tables and chairs, horse brasses hanging along the beams, tankards on hooks behind the bar, and a large unlit fireplace with a fat Labrador lying in front of it, probably dreaming of winter blazes. It was a Saturday night and reasonably busy without being uncomfortably so. Anyone who wanted a seat would be able to find one, and there were a few couples sitting, some eating, some drinking. The women seemed to be drinking either port and lemon or lime and soda. Hers was the only sherry in the room. A scrum of men stood at the bar, and there were sure to be more in the public bar. There were occasional curious glances her way, but not judging or unfriendly. So much of a pub's atmosphere depending on the st depended on the standard the publican set. If he treated Violet as if she belonged, so would her cu his customers. Thank you. I'd like to just touch on how you actually write your books. Um, I've, I've read that you write longhand, and yeah. you do that because you feel that gives you, well, two things. One, it slows your pace so you can become more considered about what words you're putting down, but also because it allows you to map, map things out, see where you've changed direction. Um, and, and, and in a sense, navigate through the writing and the re rewriting, you know, go back to places that you liked and go to new places if you want to. And so I was fascinated in that process uh, that you yeah. used for that. And also, um, I know very, when I was doing Threads of Life, I found it very interesting that actually the books I read at night were about landscape, which I'd never done really before in my life. Do you mean nature writing? Nature writing. So right. it was Robert McFarlane, it was Nan Shepherd, it was people like that. And for some reason, that's what I craved was that kind of writing. What did and you normally write, read? Sorry. Oh, uh, normally read um, uh, much, uh, well, d uh, fiction. Fiction, basically, yes. And, um, yes. and what, I, what, I, what I thought was maybe that was because I was trying to explore the landscape of needlework. And so I needed another kind of writing to help me right. know how to do that. So and not so specifically reading about n needlework, because that would be too close, but actually yes, sometimes but something as that's a tangent. Sometimes as deadlines loomed, I yeah. would actually have to go to bed with those five books that I hadn't managed to, <laughs> to research yeah. yet. So I was interested about what you, both that process that you use for writing, but also what you read when you're writing. Um, the process, I, I do write by hand, at least this, the, the first, the start of it. So I, I write during the day by hand, and then at the end of the day or every few days, I'll type in to the computer what I've written. But the first pass needs to be, the first creative from the brain to the page is, is the hand. And um, maybe it's because I learned how to write. We all learn how to write first this way rather than typing, although I have heard that young people some young people don't know how to write anymore. They just go straight onto the screen, which kind of horrifies me. But I, I just find doing this and looking at a screen um, isn't, it just doesn't feel like it's reflecting what's actually in my mind. Partly it's the speed, as you mentioned, I think around the same speed that I write, whereas I type quite fast. So maybe 
writing keeps me at the right speed I need. And, and also, um, when I'm writing, I'm often crossing things out, moving things around, and there's a roadmap of what I've done uh, right there on the page. Whereas if you type it in, I know you can use uh, uh, track changes on Word documents, but it's so hard to figure that out. And it's much clearer to me with pen and ink. And I, I just, I, I like it that way. Um, and of course, the computer is really useful for the editing process. Um, though I don't tend to edit on the screen either. I, I print it all out and I mess around with it on. So again, it's very tactile. Um, and maybe that goes back to making things like m quilting and make, you know, there's a real connection with the hand. Um, what I read, I, I am not, uh, I know that some writers who write fiction have said they can't read fiction while they're writing because they feel that they're going to imitate um, the, the writer that they're that they're reading, and I wish I could imitate some of the writers <laughs> I'm reading. I'd love to imitate Margaret Atwood or Toni Morrison. I can't, though. I don't know how to. As, as you could tell from the reading, I can't do accents, so I, didn't, I don't even try to do an English accent. Even though I've lived here for 35 years, I still sound like this. And, and, um, and I think the same with, um, with reading. I, I read a lot of fiction, uh, happily so, and it doesn't seem to have any effect on my, uh, on my, my own writing. Um, I do also read a lot for research, and I, like you, there's often a stack of books that I need to read for the research, and I keep putting them off because I find writing, reading nonfiction takes me a lot longer, uh, especially because I'm taking notes and I'm trying to figure it out, and, um, but just in general, it takes me longer, and, so, and, and it's not as fun. Fiction, I want to find out what's going to happen. I care a lot about the characters, and somehow nonfiction, I just don't have that emotional tug in the same way. Uh, and so I, I find I often put it off until the last minute. And so when you're researching, you're taking notes. Yeah. What are you taking? Where are you putting those notes? How I organized I are you? I put them in a notebook. But I, I want to go back for a moment to the yes. writing by hand, because you told me earlier, and I love this. So when you're writing, you write by hand as well. Yes. And you said that you have to have the first page of the book book, or is it of each chapter? Or of each chapter. If each chapter has to be perfect, perfectly handwritten before you can go on. Which means that Blair, if Blair, let's <laughs> unpack that one. I love <laughs> it. I love it. So, so what I was saying was, you know, basically if I'm, if I'm four lines down and then I cross out a phrase, then I might write another couple of lines, but then I have to write the whole thing again in order to continue. Okay. Until I've got that first longhand written page, and then you and can go on like and be messy. That's messy? the foundation. That's the, like the foundation stone, and then I'm happy. And then I can go on and be as messy as I want. But until but it, that it. first bit has to be perfect. So I have a waste paper basket, which just is constantly getting filled. And obviously, it takes time because you you get near the bottom of that page. Yeah. <laughs> And you mess and up. And then you mess up, and you're thinking, oh, I have to do it all again. And it's, it is, of course, it's deeply troubling. It reminds, me of, <laughs> it reminds me of a story I, I remember uh, with, the, with Charlotte Bronte, I think, writing. She would, she would sit and write on little pieces of paper a sentence over and over to get it just right, and then she would write it on the manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's one you know, little fiddly pieces of paper. But I think that all writers have these odd little odd things that we do to get ourselves through. And that's your oddity. That's right. There do you, you keep your, uh, your handwritten, all your notes, do you keep all those notes yeah, as I you write I in I case I there might be something that you were yes, going to? Yes, I, I take notes in notebooks. Yes. Um, so I have research notebooks, and I also then I, I write the books in notebook. Um, and actually, I, I started... The Girl of the Pearl Earring, I had a research notebook, and then the, the, man, the, the book I wrote on scraps of paper, uh, scrap paper, and then I threw it away after, you know, I didn't know it was gonna do what it did. I had no idea. I just thought it was gonna be published, sink like a stone, and then I'd go back to editing or whatever. And, and so I, I threw away what I probably could sell now, but um, <laughs> never mind. And I, uh, but then I started, uh, I wanted to keep I started wanting to write them the whole book in, in notebooks. So I think from one of the books onward, I started, I've kept all the notebooks. And, um, and I hear that actually for your notebooks, 
you used to, um, I don't know if you still do it, but had to have a cover that actually in some way captured the essence yeah. of the book that you were planning. Is that true? Y yes, yes, uh, to, a, to a degree. I mean, so when I wrote a book called The Lady and the Unicorn, it was about medieval tapestries, and I got this beautiful burgundy velvet that had a this similar color, and Girl of the Pearl Earring, the research notebook, was a, um, an, a little orange notebook that just pleased me because it fit my hand, and I had, a, I had the, the painting, a copy of the painting, inside the inside cover. I didn't want it uh, to be on pasted on the front because it get all bashed up. And I didn't want people to know what I was doing. So had it inside, and then I could open it and look at her anytime. And um, uh, and then I, for the last Runaway, which was a quilting book, I had this kind of flowered. I saw it. I was in Australia, and I saw it, and I said, "That's the that's the kind of s kind of calico. It's the kind of cloth that I that my my character would have seen a lot of in the states because she emigrates to the states and." But you know, in recently, uh, I have the last couple of books. I haven't really, uh, well, the the yeah, the last couple of books. I've um, I've started the research at a point where I haven't been able to find the notebook I need, and I just reach in. I have a lot of notebooks. People give them to me, or I see them, and I just reached. I rummaged around in a cupboard and found one that would do. And so I think I'm moving away from that. Compulsive behavior. But it, yeah, compulsive <laughs> behavior or, or ritualization of the writing process. Yes. I'm, I'm slightly, I do still write, if I can, with this, which is a, uh, in this day and age, it's a no-no. It's a throwaway uh, fountain pen. And, um, but I've tried real fountain pens and they don't work for me. Mm. So um, I am, um, these work. So I, that's what I sign books with too. So I brought it along. But I, I but I, you know, I, I can write with not, I can write perfectly well with a different pen. So I don't sort of freak out mm -hmm. if I don't have it. It's just there are certain things that have developed that have worked for me over time. So for instance, I usually write my novels at home in my, um, in my office which is this little room at the back of the house, but it, it's got my computer in it, and that is just like a, it just sucks you in, the internet and all that. So I find myself, I start off in my office, and then I gravitate to the sofa in the living room with just a big book, big hardback book and a piece of paper, and I just sit there and write like that, and that's kind of how it works for me. But, and I can't work in cafes and, I remember Umberto Eco said once he could write anywhere if he could if he had a waterproof pen and paper he'd write in the shower and I thought oh, uh, <laughs> yeah whatever not me no. <laughs> I'm on my sofa. Uh, 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 talking about that, uh, I, I like the fact that on your website you've got a quote from Ernest Hem Hemingway that says write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and I wondered if you we got a little pattern here <laughs> with the pub and the <laughs> Hemingway yes. And I wondered if you followed those principles. I, I admit I don't really write drunk, but I write freely. That's what he meant. You you write with um, with bravado, with freedom. The first draft, the first pass, and maybe that's why I don't feel so free doing that, and I feel much mm. freer doing that. But the editing is when you have to be really strict and tough with yourself, and you need a clear, sober head to say, why did you use that adjective? You look at a sentence and you go what are you doing here? You know, th why are you why are you using two adjectives when one would do? Um, do you need that? Do you need that? Cut it, cut it, cut it right back. And and you have to be kind of ruthless with yourself all the way through. So the only way, you, ca you can't do that drunk, so you have to do that sober. And I think those two things are really, really important, and, and they balance each other. And the another balance is, is n kind of knowing what you're, what the pat what you're writing, kind of planning, but also within the writing day, when I'm writing a paragraph, being a little spontaneous too. So it's a, it's a, it's trying to balance the planning and spontaneity. So there's a lot of this going on with with writing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you found that as well. That you just have to. Um, there's always a calibration and self-editing is so important. I think that's where most writers who haven't published <laughs> fall down because they're not ruthless enough with themselves. Yes, I think it must be much harder writing fiction because I was writing a non-fiction book. Then if I wasn't in the place to do the creative writing, I could always do more research. And right. that meant that I was still writing or I was writing up something, but I wasn't necessarily having to 
to, to be in that free flow of creative writing. And, and to do that, I, I actually found I needed to be completely solitary. You couldn't have family life around me. Uh, whereas I can edit and I can rewrite yeah. in, in amongst hustle and bustle. But I actually can't be creative in that. There are very different very processes. Yes. There are very different stages of writing. Yes, yes the, edi the writing and the editing, it quite requires a different mindset. Mm -hmm. I think. So there are different kinds of yeah. uh, atmospheres you have to be in to do those different jobs. Yeah. I'm going to open up to questions because I'm sure people are, uh, ah. have got many questions that they would like to oh, ask. Oh, the lights are up. Okay. Oh, here's a hand up here. There's roving mics, so a roving mic will come to you. The Hi, this is about New Boy. Okay. I was really interested in Mimi's migraines. So as soon as stop, I probably most of the audience hasn't hasn't read it, and they won't. And it's really specific question. So the best thing is for you to come come to me afterwards and ask. I will. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, good. Here's a hand here. Okay, my name is Gudrun, I'm from Germany. Uh, Hi. And thank you very much, Tracy, for your talk, especially uh, the part about the European um, <laughs> So I like it very much. <laughs> no, um, if I look around, I see mainly uh, women here, ladies. Can you, could you explain why? I wonder why. Um, I think there's a really easy answer for that, um, which is that uh, women, uh, I think that women in general read more than men, first of all, and women tend to read fiction, not always, but, but in general tend to read fiction, and in general men read nonfiction, and I write fiction, so that's why. It's also possibly because um, a lot of my main characters are women, and that sort of naturally appeals. I, you know, again, I hate to do sweeping, but if you're trying to figure out why, it may also be women just come to, um, tend to come to festivals more, they feel more at home here or something. So all of those things. Yes. Are you down here in the, oh, come to you next. I'd like to ask about one of your books that has a male protagonist uh, at the edge of the orchard. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm curious to know whether you were inspired from the English end of things or the Western American end of things. I mean, oh. where where did you become interested in the trees? Okay. Um, at the edge of the orchard is a book or two ago about a uh, an American family who live in the States in the 19th century, and it, it focuses on two types of trees, apple trees and redwoods and sequoias. And um, it's, it's sort of a pioneer, dysfunctional pioneer family in 19th century America. And I, I was interested, I, I became interested in writing about trees, first of all, and apple trees specifically. And then I started looking into, there's a folk hero named Johnny Appleseed um, in the States, and that was what drew me in, um, which was 19th century. So that, it was that first, and then, um, and then the, the pioneers came after. And the, the Hi, I'd like to write, uh, to ask about your uh, female characters. Yeah. And um, you write about very strong women who, who I feel are very believable. But how do you find out or work through the issue of how to write about women in historical contexts um, believably without imbuing them with modern sensibilities? Mm. It's really hard, and the temptation is always to have them be um, banner-waving and, and more, more like us. Um, and I think the only thing I can do, it, well, there are a number of things. One is during the research to try to read the voices of the women, if at all possible, if it's if their letters or diaries, um, things that they have said themselves rather than um, what we have said about them, like historians have said about the people and the women in the past, or or the men have said about them, um, and that's not always easy because you're trying to get, um, uh, you know, if it's way in the past, a lot of women didn't have much agency, couldn't read, couldn't write, um, weren't published. Uh, so, but but this one actually, a, a single thread was a little easier because a lot of women were writing then. So I read a lot of journals and I read. I le read a lot of novels set at that time. Um, and uh, just to, to try to get a, the mindset of what a, a woman would have been like then, and I just was really vigilant about not 
not allowing them to sound too much like me and um, and not um, not making them more uh, more feminist than they would necessarily be, or, or more aware, more conscious, and more analytical. Um, sometimes it slipped through, and, and, and then other times I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a deliberate moment here. But uh, with Girl of the Pearl Earring, for instance, it was so tempting to have uh, the main character in that book, Greet the Maid, um, learn to paint or, or be more um, be more proactive and and but I had to keep telling myself she's really powerless here and and I have to respect that 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 was how it was at the time I can't rewrite history so a lot of it is just awareness as I'm writing and researching and also just to say I think it's really interesting that you give us more insight into the, the women's behavior and women's conditions at different times and because we trust your research then yeah. for instance with Violet that she does have one night stands and meets men yeah uh, which is not what you would you think that character is going to be doing but that's one of the ways that she deals with her loneliness and her life uh, and I'm sure it was, was true of that time um, so th you also are revelatory you know in terms of yes. how, how you open up to us yes. women's lives yeah sorry another no, question no that's all right Oh, lots of questions. I uh, think there's someone here. Someone no. here. Oh, start right. Oh, right. Gentleman yes. in the middle. Oh. Yes. Do you police yourself in uh, writing a novel? I'd like to know how long it takes you from start to finish and whether you're doing it faster now than you did. <laughs> Yee. No, I'm not doing it faster. Um, I, it's funny, I once sat at a dinner party with a, a lawyer next to me and he said, so how long is a novel? Uh, and I said, uh, pff, well, it could be anything from 70,000 words to, you know, well, I don't know, War and Peace is a million words, I think. And, and, but, and he said, yeah, well, how long are your novels? And I said, well, they're usually around 90,000 words. And he said, and how much do you write per day? And I thought, oh, I know where this is going. Um, so I said, well, there's, uh, there's a lot of things I do, so there's a lot of research. When I'm in the writing phase, I try to write a thousand words. So, uh, th 90 days to write a novel. <laughs> uh, so three months, if you're not taking breaks. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, but it's not like that. And, and he, but he just went on and thought, he said, I think I'm gonna write a novel. So I thought, okay, <laughs> buddy, you try it out. Um, it, it's, it's when I am in the writing phase, and when I start writing a novel, I really try to keep going because that's one of the things is you wanna feel that consistency all the way through. Um, I do try to write three or four pages a day, which is about a thousand words, and it, it just feels right to me. It feels like if I write more than that, I start getting sloppy. If I write less than that, I'm not pushing myself enough. It just, over the years, it's felt like the right amount. Um, but there's a lot that goes on around that. I get interrupted, or I, I start writing a scene, and I realize I don't know anything about uh, typists in 1930s insurance offices. What kind of typewriter would she have used? What were the hours? Did they work Saturday mornings? I don't know. What would, you know and so I suddenly realize I, I have to stop and look into this. So I do a lot of research at the start, good six months worth before I start writing the book. And, but there's always really specific stuff that then comes up, which is what Google is not too bad, is, is better at, yeah. is, is asking really specific questions. But to get the general sense of a time, I have to read around the subject an awful lot. And um, uh, so the, 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 sh the short answer is, my, it takes me two to three years to write a novel. And I, I, uh, I'm maybe a little faster than I used to be because uh, my son has grown up, so I, I have more time now. He's 20 now, so he's at university, so he's away. It's just, n doesn't take quite so much time, so I have more time. Um, but then uh, sometimes the, the subject can be really tough and um, takes a lot of time, or it can be really quick, like a, uh, th uh, the young woman who mentioned the book New Boy was a retelling of Othello which was for a, a specific Shakespeare project. And I wrote that in a year because the story had already been told for me by Shakespeare, so I could just kind of follow it along. And I set it in a 1970s American school playground where I'd grown up. And 
So I didn't have to do the kind of research that I would normally do. So I could write it quickly, and it was short. So I could write it quickly. But then the next book I'm writing, after Single Thread now, I, um, is going to be set in Venice. And it's going to go from 15th century Venice to 21st century Venice. So it's going to be big. It's about glass, glass beads. And, and that is going to, I can feel already, even, I mean, I've only done a bit of research, I can feel that it's going to take me longer. So, sorry, but watch this space. It'll be a few years, because you can, you, sometimes you can just tell the subject is weighty, and other times it feels more manageable. So it just depends. At the back here. Oh, and, then, and, then, and then you. And then her, yes. yeah. I was going to say, well, just waiting for that, when, when I was doing my book, my husband, Charlie, would say, is that book not finished yet? <laughs> and I'd say, well, I'm trying to write a good book. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Tracy. Uh, I'm, my name's Brenda. I live in Argyle. Um, I'm a retired French teacher. Yeah. So I'm very interested in your surname. And I absolutely loved your first novel about... Um, uh, the, the Virgin Blue, Thank set you. in the town and Sivan and Switzerland. So I'm just wondering about, uh, you know, do you actually have uh, French or French Protestant or Huguenot um, yes, ancestry? Yes, I ah. do. My, my father was born in Switzerland mm -hmm. and emigrated when he was a boy to the States with his parents. So my grandparents were Swiss and we can trace the Chevaliers in this little town of Moutier, which takes place in the first novel, The Virgin Blue. We can trace the Chevaliers all the way back to 1574. And this, the family story is that they, um, they, f they were French Huguenots who fled from the Cévennes in 1572 and finally made their way up and ended up in this town. And um, but we don't really have any confirmation of it because th all the records have been, you know, th uh, there were a lot of fires back then and just most things got destroyed. So, um, but I, I wrote that first novel in part because although I, I knew these sort of family legends I, or history, I, um, I wanted to explore the time. I kn it, it's not a story about the Chevaliers, but it's set in the same places so that I could explore them just out of curiosity. Um, so that's where that all comes from. Mm. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yep. Yep. Um, I loved reading about your the quilting in The Runaway Slave, and I write like hearing about the embroidery in this, this book, and interested that you, you do these things before you write the book. I've tried, and I'm terrible at stitching. And I just wondered, do you feel that everyone or anyone can learn how to do these things? And the second part was, was following on from your next book. Are you doing glass work now as well? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer the first one, the glass first, and then I think Claire and I should both talk about the stitching because Claire does an awful lot of it. Well, um, we, what we want to know is, are, are you going to, do, going to do glass work in Venice? I am. Oh yes, has to be in Venice. Oh, I am. Um, I will definitely. I mean, I've already been to Venice a few times. I've been to Murano, which is where the glass happens, and I've. I've watched them, um, and I've had them talk me through what they're doing, but I haven't actually done it myself yet. And I will, I will definitely, because I, it's impossible. It's it's so tempting too, and and uh, exciting. So I definitely will. Stitching can some people do it and not others? Um, well, we were talking earlier that we're both doing quilting. Yeah. And actually, what we like about quilting is we don't do it terribly well. Yeah. And although actually professionally <laughs> I'm a banner maker, yeah. and, and so I do do sewing as a profession, what I like about the quilting is that it's not judgmental. It's very, it's just yeah. something I'm doing because it absor absorbs me and you know, you, I'm using my hands in a very simple way. Yes. So actually sometimes the simplest stitches, well you go on. Cause well we I, think, I think there are, are definitely different types of sewing you can do where um, the stitching is either to the, is, is to the fore so you see it whether it's even or not. And then there's other kinds of stitching that you can't, even if it's uneven you can't really see it. So I think you have to find what works for you or what is, um, you know, what 
me, as, as we we're saying, that I, I like the unevenness of hand quilting. Some people make quilts and then they get them uh, machine quilted or they, they use a machine and it, and it looks a little, to me, a little artificial, a little too, too samey and too, um, too even. Hand stitching is, is kind of, it's the mistakes that make it. Yeah. It's the unevenness that makes it good. You just, but you have to sort of find, you have to get them to the right mindset for that. So it's, um, I think anybody can sew. It's just finding the thing that works for you. And, and uh, I had recently got given a little doll that uh, a graduate from the Graph School of Art had made, and it's the most anarchic, <laughs> you know, roughly stitched deliberately. Yeah. And I love it. It's just got its real character. So yeah. you can, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's not given to neat stitching, then use your unneat stitching for a good creative end, is what I'd yeah. suggest. Uh, Do we have time for maybe one more? Just one more one quick more. one here, over here, in the, and then... Hi, um, my name's Liz, I'm from DC. Woohoo! Oh, um, okay. <laughs> and um, I just was curious, I'm, I'm new to you, um, so forgive me if I'm asking a question that everybody else here already knows, um, but it, in hearing about all your other books, I'm only familiar with The Girl with the Pearl Earring, and I'm very excited about this new book. Um, do you, when you think of what your new book is going to be like, do you wait for something to grab you? Do you have an inkling in your head of something you'd be interested in trying that you'd like to build a story around? How do you go about finding your inspiration? It, it really varies. Uh, so with Girl the Pearl Earring, I, I knew the poster really well. I had it hanging in my house and in my flat, and, uh, and I just one morning was looking at it, and I suddenly thought, I wonder what he did to her to make her look like that, and um, and it became. It, and I suddenly thought, this is a this is a portrait of a relationship, and I want to know what that relationship is. So it's really literally like that. Um, and I've I've been I've walked around a cemetery in London and s and thought the atmosphere here is so great. I have to set a novel here. Uh, and then other times it's been a little more considered. So the a single thread I had had in my head in the back of my mind that I wanted to uh, write something set in and around a cathedral, but it took me several years to kind of get to that point. And, but then the moment when I thought this is the story in the cathedral, again was a, I, I saw the cushions and kneelers and went, yes, that's it. So it, it just, um, if I try to find a story, if I'm saying, okay, what can I write about? It doesn't come. I just have to be patient and let it leap on me usually kind of, uh, usually it will, it will take up a strand that I've been puzzling at and suddenly it clicks into place what the thing is. But um, it usually happens when I'm in the middle of writing something. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of a novel and it, particularly if I'm at a difficult point in a novel, I'll be writing along and then uh, and, I'll, and I'll not be very happy with what I'm writing. I'm thinking this is boring. What, uh, 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 and then I'll have a flash of, oh, I could write about Mary Anning. Oh, I could write a, a, this uh, thing in the cathedral, or I could write about apples. And, and uh, I want to do that. I'm going to drop what I'm writing, and I'm going to take that up. Because we all have unfinished um, projects around. And, um, I, and the, the quilters call them UFOs, unfinished objects. <laughs> and um, we all have them, and it's because we're really bad at finishing things. And I've learned, I've got to, when I have that moment, I think, great, that's fantastic, you've got your next book. Now put it on the back burner and get back to work. <laughs> so I get back to work, but I'm happier because I've got bubbling away the next one. And, and that's always a good thing. And we were talking about this earlier, that when, you're, when, you're, when you publish a book, when it comes out and it's meeting the public, it's really great doing it and talking about it, but it's also really good to have to have just started work on something else so that you've got the, because it can get a little chaotic and you just find that you need that touchstone in your life of, yes, yes, I love a single thread and I also love those Venetian glass beads I'm going to be reading about next week. So always good to have that, um, but it's got to take the back burner at the time. Thank you, JC. Well, a single thread luckily is finished. Yes, it is, <laughs> <laughs> and is as as we said, is is, is on on uh, is here, which is amazing because it's not out till the fifth of September, so you can get a special advance copy. Tracy yeah. will be signing copies in the in the signing tent, and again, if you've got particular questions you want to ask her about any of her 
uh, novels yes, or her writing then yeah. come and see her in the book tent. Could I thank you for being a really responsive audience and could I thank our guest, the wonderful Tracy Chevalier. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.